So everybody, welcome back. Understand the, the victory bells are out there and Mike Bell's competing with the victory bells, which usually doesn't turn out well for Mike Bell, but hey, th <laughs> thanks for the, the last uh, session of today's symposium. Obviously after this, we're gonna have another, uh, the opening piece, but we've had some amazing panels today uh, and we're gonna have another one. Uh, so we've looked at resistance in Germany and Austria along the Eastern Front. We've considered how opposition to fascism so, uh, shaped social political relations in Italy and France. Uh, as uh, our last panel showed, uh, we have a common foe created with complex relationships uh, during the Second World War. It'll be interesting to see how those, uh, the memory of those is different today than it was during the Cold War, for example. Uh, but the, how those could exacerbate tensions among those different groups. So in this panel, uh, we're privileged to have Dr. Sarah Bennett Farmer from the University of California at Irvine, and our own uh, Jenny Craig Institute's Dr. Jason Dawsey, who's back again, thanks Jason, uh, to give us a fascinating look at this topic in a panel entitled, External Threat, Internal Struggles. Uh, so uh, to moderate this is uh, Dr. Mark Calhoun, so a recent addition to the Jenny Craig Institute, uh, military historian as our chair. Now Mark's a retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, previously a U.S. Army CH-47 Chinook uh, helicopter pilot and a war planner, uh, Sam's graduate, so the, the Jedi Knights of, uh, of campaign planning. He, he received his uh, PhD in history from the University of Kansas in 2012, and his first book is on uh, General Leslie J. McNair, Unsung Architect of the U.S. Army, was published by the University of Kansas Press in 2015. He's currently researching uh, General William S. Simpson, Commander of the 9th U.S. Army, and the 9th Army's operations during the campaign in Northwest Europe. Uh, so, uh, you know, Mark, uh, welcome to this campaign. And with that, uh, we're going to turn it over to you and, and this panel. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. So I'll just say, uh, after 35 consecutive years of government service, uh, working here now is a pretty neat change of pace. So it's really a, <laughs> it's an honor to be here today. Um, I'm really excited about this panel, so we'll just go ahead and get started. I know we're the only thing standing between all of you and happy hour, so. Uh, <laughs> but I, I promise you it'll be worth your time. Um, so the panelists that I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be here with, Dr. Farmer, uh, is, works at University of California, Irvine. She did her undergraduate work at Yale University and earned her PhD at Berkeley. Um, and she has a, a, a couple of wonderful books out, Martyred Village, Commemorating the Massacre at Orador sur uh, which is a, a really cool book available in both English and French in various editions, and also her most recent book, Rural Inventions, The French Countryside After 1945, uh, just came out in 2020. And you already know uh, Dr. Jason Dawsey uh, from our institute, uh, and he's going to talk to us today about the resistance in occupied Italy during the war. So. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Farmer. Okay, hello. So my subject is Vive la Résistance, and I'll start by asking a rhetorical question to which there's not an easy answer. To what extent did the French participate in resistance? This is a very simple question. Uh, answers are complex. The most common response in France to the defeat by German forces in May 1940, the subsequent occupation, and the establishment of an authoritarian French regime was that of getting by. Most put their trust in World War I hero Marshal Pétain and were relieved to be out of the war. Through 1942, most French people carried on business as usual. Yet an important minority of people organized resistance to the Vichy regime and the Nazi occupation. I want to start by giving some key distinctions and sort of a framework before discussing uh, specific examples or cases of resistors and their activities. So we can speak of resistance with a big R and resistance with a little r. That can be a distinction between formal movements. And with a little r, you, we can be t talking about things that are more diffuse, but that are nonetheless resistance, whether or not they have a, a sort of a formal structure. I'll speak about external resistance. That is resistance that was, that was uh, carried on from outside France, internal resistance, and with some examples of uh, two uh, individuals in particular. Uh, 
So if we talk about external resistance, we're speaking for the most part of Charles de Gaulle and his organization, the Free French, supported by Special Operations Executive, which was British. In 1940, Charles de Gaulle was a junior general in the French army. He was brought into Paul Reynaud's cabinet as deputy war minister in March 1940. When the German army approached Paris, having invaded, in, de Gaulle left Paris with Prime Minister Reynaud as the French government fled to Bordeaux. Reynaud wanted to continue the war against opposition, uh, wanted to continue the war against the opposition in his cabinet. But defeatist elements in the cabinet, led by Pétain in particular, prevailed. On June 16th, Reynaud resigned. The next day, Charles de Gaulle made a dramatic escape to London in the airplane of the departing British delegation. You can read a marvelous description of this, of his escape to London in Churchill's memoirs. The next day, de Gaulle went on the BBC radio to deliver the famous call of the, 19th, of, of the 18th of June. His, he said, and I'll just give one short quotation, speaking in full knowledge of the facts, I ask you to believe me when I say that the cause of France is not lost. For remember, France does not stand alone. She has a vast empire behind her. The outcome of the struggle has not been decided by the Battle of France. Whatever happens, the flame of French resistance must and shall not die. Now, those, there are ellipses in there. That's, these are lines from his speech. His words became famous long after the fact because very few people actually heard this broadcast. And in fact, no original recording of it exists. The essence of de Gaulle's call and political legitimacy in the long run was that he never recognized the Vichy government as a legitimate government. For him, the republic still existed. This was not the American point of view. The US recognized the Vichy regime and sent an ambassador there. De Gaulle's biggest problem was getting the British and the Americans to take him seriously as the representative of France. Churchill found him difficult. Roosevelt, uh, he made Roosevelt uneasy. Roosevelt wondered whether or not he was a potential demagogue, a general who had not been elected to office but had come to uh, claim legit the, to be the, the, the legitimate leader of France. As you know, the Pétain regime went on to sue the Germans for an armistice that was signed on June 22nd. And they set up their government in the spa town of Vichy in central France. So that, that's where the, the government, uh, the French government went. And here is a map that gives you, that shows you the way in which France was divided under the terms of the armistice. The country was divided. Germany would occupy the northern zone and the French regime was, had nominal sovereignty and in de facto control of the southern zone. And this lasted until 1942 when uh, the uh, Allies landed in North Africa and the and Germans moved down into uh, the rest of France. Doesn't want to advance. Doesn't want to advance. Let's try. Ah, thank you. OK. So <clears throat> here are some distinctions I've made uh, to speak about internal resistors. Internal resistance was directed as much, if not more, against Vichy as against the German occupiers. I've made a distinction here between people who were referred to themselves or were referred to as legals and illegals. Legals were activists who remained living at home and doing their jobs. They operated above ground on a full or part-time basis. Ordinary peacetime professions became vehicles for subversive activities. And that's something that one can talk about in more detail um, in, the, in our roundtable discussion. Illegals were people who assumed new identities. Illegals often left home and went underground. Resistors were a very heterogeneous group. They included communists, socialists, Catholics, workers, school teachers, peasants, aristocrats. Few professional military men took part. Many admired Pétain, and when they no longer did, often they couldn't get over their distaste for the amateur military organization and the leftist tendency of the interior resistance. <clears throat> 
The Communist Party got into the resistance early, but not without some twists and turns. The Communists had been big anti-fascists in the 1930s, when the Third Reich and the Soviet Union signed a pact of non-aggression in 1939, many communists were dismayed. But most adhered to the party line. That was, this is a war of the capitalist classes and communists should not have nothing to do with it. In response to the Hitler-Stalin pact, the French government outlawed the communist party and began arresting active party members. Scrambling to save the party, communists went underground and gained experience in clandestine activity before any identifiable resistance movement began. Internal resistance took many forms, putting out underground press, hiding Jews, gathering information for the resistance networks. I'll mention two forms and two individuals today. I won't be saying anything in particular about women in the resistance. We have a panel devoted to this tomorrow, as well as a conversation with Nicole Spangenberg about resistance in France. So my first example is that of Adolf Kaminsky, a Jewish teenager born in Argentina to Russian parents who became the best forger of false identity cards in all of France. Providing false papers was one of the most important resistance activities. Kaminsky talks about this in a remarkable memoir that was published in 2016 and translated into English in 2019. There he is at age 19, and that's the title of his book, A Forger's Life. Kaminsky is believed to have saved 14,000 people during the war with his work. His activity has come to light only recently because he continued beyond the war forging papers for causes and people he believed in. And he didn't want to speak until he was sure that the statute of limitations had passed. <laughs> um, and reading his memoir is a delight because it, you learn an enormous amount about how this young guy who had very little education became a master at chemistry, at photography, at paper making, uh, and, on, and clandestine activity. Here is an example of his work. And you can see here on the right, uh, there's an identity card that's to the far right that says uh, Julian Keller, and that was his own uh, identity paper that he made for himself. He fabricated the paper, he fabricated the stamps, he did it all. Until 1942, when the Germans invaded the southern zone, resistance activity was primarily political and directed against Vichy. Propaganda, strikes, demonstrations. Once the Germans arrived in the southern zone, resistance took a new direction to more paramilitary resistance focused on direct action. So here's a little bit of vocabulary. The French word uh, maquis uh, refers to uh, people who went, went to, went, took to the hills. So the term maquis for guerrilla organizations and the term maquisard for a member of such an organization. The growth of the maquis was spurred by the forced labor draft for men between the ages of 20 and 23 to, to work in Germany. It wasn't the cause of it, but it's certainly um, the, the, the ranks of the Maquis swelled when people in the spring of 1943 were looking at the possibility of being sent off on a train to work in Germany. So I wanna to speak to you for a moment about an exceptional leader named uh, Georges Gangouin. Georges Gangouin was a schoolmaster in the small town of saint gilles forêt in the Limousin region of central France. Gangouin was a communist who never wavered from anti-Nazism. He defied the party line and resisted Vichy and the Germans from the get-go. He was a school teacher and at the same time secretary to the mayor. In small towns in, in France at the time, you would have a, a one-room schoolhouse that also had a one-room mairie, a town hall in the same building. And Gangouin used his access to, uh, as the secretary to the mayor, to access to the village, to the, the stamp of the village to make false identity papers. And the police soon noticed that there were a lot of people suddenly who had papers that were stamped with the, uh, the village of saint gilles forêt When the police came after him, Gangouin took the mimeograph machine from the classroom and head out, head out for the woods. He produced anti-Vichy and anti-German tracts, 
which he distributed in, uh, on, on market days in local villages. He insisted on the independence of local action. And for that, the Communist Party stripped him of all political responsibilities. So he was both somebody who was wanted by the Vichy authorities, later by the German authorities, and who was persona non grata among the communists. He gathered support by protecting pe peasant interests. He linked his actions with, lo with, the local, with local problems. And in the fall of 1942, he began a campaign against Vichy's requisitioning of hay. The government food supply administration brought bailing machines into town squares and ordered peasants to bring their loose hay and sell it at a very low price. They then bailed it and shipped it out of the region. Gang Guang got a blacksmith and a wheelwright to help him. They made bombs out of wagon axles stuffed with explosive material taken from fixtures on overhead power lines of the electric tram system. And they blew up the bailing machines. And so this is what they were fighting against. Uh, these uh, attempts to get people to hand over their, their uh, agricultural produce. In winter and spring 1943, they attacked railway lines. Because the Maquis did not receive arms until late in the war, their activity was limited to sabotage. So here's a picture of Gangwan in his uh, military garb. And here's a picture uh, of him printing tracts. And he's uh, this was for a, a, a newspaper article about him after the, after the war. In winter and spring 1943, they attacked railway lines. Spring 1943 marked a major turning point. The resistance began to anticipate Allied invasion, and the Vichy authorities organized militia groups that worked with the Gestapo to fight the resistance. In spring 1943, Macizard engaged in skirmishes with, the, with these militias, and France entered into a state of undeclared civil war. De Gaulle disapproved of direct action. With reason, he deemed the risks too great because direct action brought the poss possibility of reprisal against civilians. De Gaulle also feared communist political objectives. Therefore, he sought to organize interior resistance behind, behind himself and the Free French. To that end, Jean Moulin, as de Gaulle's representative, was parachuted into France on January 1, 1942. By the end of May, Moulin had succeeded in uniting eight major groups before being arrested on June 21, 1943. He was tortured by Klaus Barbie and the Gestapo. Moulin died on July 8 without having uttered a word of betrayal. He had done the essential work to ensure de Gaulle's position as the leader of the French resistance. And here is de Gaulle in that capacity speaking to a crowd at the Paris City Hall on August 25th, 1944, the day that Paris was liberated. On a winter's day in 1964, in ceremonies marking the 20th anniversary of the liberation, Jean Moulin's ashes were transferred to the Pantheon, the final resting place for the, for the nation's civic heroes. In front of de Gaulle, most of the government, and hundreds of school children, André Malraux, French writer and de Gaulle's minister of culture, evoked Moulin's suffering and death. On that day, Malraux said, his was the face of France. Jason? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to, uh, to see you again and to, uh, to be able to continue this discussion about resistance. Uh, I'm going to focus on Italy in 1943-44 just simply because the, the subject of uh, the Italian resistance itself is very difficult to compress into 15 minutes, but obviously in, in our roundtable and the Q&A we'll have a chance to um, push this toward the end of the war. So I thought I would just begin with this uh, image, just one from our collection. It's actually a U.S. Army Signal Corps photo, uh, so probably stylized, but says a lot. Uh, probably late 1944, early 1945. It's kind of unclear exactly when it's taken, but showing both women and men involved in partisan activity, looking at this map. You can see the, the weapons that they're carrying. But this, however stylized it may be, the photo really does give some insight about 
the character of resistance in, in Italy that developed, that women as well as men became involved, and that was no small feat in a culture as patriarchal as the Italian one was, and where women in Italy did not actually get the right to vote even until after the war was over. So what I want to just do very briefly before getting into 1943-44 and looking at one representative moment of the Italian resistance is just to say something by way of, of overview. That opposition to Benito Mussolini and the fascist dictatorship had been present from the very beginning of Mussolini's movement that the Italian fascist party had been founded in Milan in March 1919. I'd like you to remember the, the, the month of March. We're gonna see that again here um, shortly in this talk. And there, of course, have been groups fighting Mussolini before he ever took power, especially on the left and the trade unions uh, and the, the socialists and communist parties. Originally, there was a single party, the Socialist Party, it had actually been Benito Mussolini's party prior to World War I, and then he moves to the extreme right. And then the socialists split in 1921. Socialists and communists reflected the divisions over World War I and, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution. Did you support the Bolsheviks? Were you ambivalent about the Bolsheviks, et cetera? But there had been fighting there, really literally in the streets, especially in northern Italy, right into 1922, when Mussolini takes power. One of the key figures that emerges as a leader in the opposition to Mussolini is a man named Antonio Gramsci. He was a Marxist intellectual from Sardinia, had led the, the Communist Party. He's really kind of one of the founding figures of it. He's arrested and imprisoned by Mussolini in 1926 and dies from complications of his imprisonment over a decade later. Some of you may have actually encountered his name. Gramsci is still widely read in, in universities here and elsewhere, especially for his notion of hegemony. He really tried to understand what was buttressing the support for the Mussolini dictatorship. There are also Italians who will volunteer to fight in the Spanish Civil War, it starts in 1936, and interestingly enough, there's a kind of civil war that plays out in Spain as Italian Republicans are often uh, communists, but some socialists and anarchists as well fight troops sent by Mussolini to support Franco. And so, and the, no, really thousands of them uh, heavily involved. And we do know even of a few, not, not a terribly large number, but some Italian leftists who went to Ethiopia even earlier in 1935-36 and fought against Mussolini there. So this has been a war already that was quite uh, a hot war well before World War II. Moving the story forward, though, if you're really going to talk about a mass resistance in Italy, you have to get to 1943. That's when it really begins when the war decisively turns against fascist Italy that year with a defeat in North Africa, May of 1943, a quarter of a million German and Italian soldiers surrendered to the Allies. And then, of course, two months later is Operation Husky as the Allies invade Sicily. Then you get the first big Allied bombing raid on Rome of the war as he's from these North African bases probably 1,000 to 3,000 people killed in this first raid, July 19th. And so a real sense within the Italian military establishment that something has to happen. This war is a disaster for Italy. There was mass discontent was already growing. And so what you have on July 24th, 25th is the fascist Grand, Grand Council votes no confidence in Mussolini. And then he is, he is told to report to see King Victor Emmanuel III, at least still has a king, the person who actually gave him the position of prime minister way back 21 years earlier. Mussolini is ousted, arrested, and imprisoned. And that really does set things moving for people to openly challenge the Italian state. So what I want to do here to note uh, this chronology, things get very dense very quickly after July 25th. That the person who is given the task of 
heading the government once Mussolini is no longer there is Marshal Pietro Badoglio. I'll show an image of him in, in just a second. The former army chief of the general staff, he had been a key figure in the invasion and occupation of Ethiopia, had been a card-carrying fascist. He is given the task by Victor Emmanuel of running the government. Initially, he says, Italy will continue the war just as it had been. And then within a week or so, he begins to secretly negotiate with the Allies to get out of the war. And that arm armistice goes into place on September 8th, 1943. The very next day, September 9th, you see a Committee of National Liberation formed in Italy. I, I won't read the parties out till you can see them on the slide here, made up of these six parties who come together to form an alternative government and there's this tension, ladies and gentlemen, between this committee, you know, it'll become, if you look from the Italian, it'll be known as the CLN, this committee and Badoglio. What a surprise, right? Look at these parties, their political orientation. You have liberals, you have socialists, you have communists, Christian Democrats, Labor Democratic Party, an action party, right? How much are they wanting to listen to a figure like Badoglio who's so linked to the military establishment? But at the start, they don't dare to challenge him openly. Now, this is September 9th. The Allies have now landed on the Italian peninsula, right? And so we're beginning to move north. And so the war is literally on Italians' doorsteps as this is happening. This is, by the way, I thought of very quickly keeping this timetable in front of us, September 12th, of course, is when Mussolini is rescued by Otto Scorzini's uh, commando team, and he's going to be reinstalled in northern Italy, what's called the Italian Social Republic, but it's essentially a puppet state. The Germans run the country. The Germans will be in power in Rome, and they will call the shots. Here's Badoglio, by the way, with General Eisenhower at the very end of September, officially signing the armistice with the Allies and the HMS Nelson in Malta. Now, this Committee on National Liberation has to work with Badoglio for the moment. And yet, at the same time, in their ranks, there's already growing discontent with this and a sense of, we need to take action now against the Germans. Mussolini's still a problem, and there's certainly an intent to settle scores with him, but, but the Germans are the immediate threat. And the Germans make it very clear about what they intend to do now that they are the actual rulers of Italy. Here is, I hope, one of the people we remember from this talk, even though I'm not spending a lot of time on him, Theodor Doniker. He is a subordinate of Adolf Eichmann, SS. He is really one of Eichmann's deportation specialists. He shows up in October 1943 in Rome to organize the deportation of Jews to the extermination camps in Poland. And one of the things he encounters is that people in Rome are not exactly terribly friendly to him and to what he's trying to do. Nonetheless, he rounds up over 1,000 Jews in Rome. They're sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau, and only a handful of them come back when the war is over. So Italians realize what is happening. Mussolini, by the way, for all his authoritarianism, had blocked Italian Jews being caught up in the Holocaust <coughs> prior to this. And then in November 1943, you're going to see Mussolini order the conscription of some 50,000 Italians. Many of them will end up as forced laborers in the German war economy, which adds an even greater degree of rage, of anger at the German occupation. Now, you can kind of, I think, hopefully see pieces beginning to fall, you know, come together here. January 1944, the Allies trying to get around the German defensive positions on the Gustav Line, landed Anzio, hoping to kind of roll up the German positions and seize Rome quickly. Inside Rome, in the capital, there's mass anticipation by members of the CLN operation, operating underground that the Allies are about to liberate the city. And I just... I love this slogan, by the way, so I had to uh, incorporate it in, that these various cells tied to the CLN, 
One of the things that you start hearing them say quite openly, January, February 1944, make the ground burn under the feet of the occupiers. To take action, to be part of their own liberation. Do not leave it to the Americans and British to liberate the capital. We need to be a part of that. And the foremost group really planning were members of the Communist Party, who at this point is kind of hard to tell the numbers. They're now kind of moving in the direction of 40, 50,000 people. Prior to the armistice, maybe 5,000. So their numbers are exploding. It's kind of interesting comparing these cases with what we've heard earlier today. I want to mention two of these individuals. Here at the museum, we often emphasize individual stories, but to show you two of these individuals, Rosario Bentevania and Carla Capone, members of a communist-directed group called the, they were a patriotic action group. In Italian would be the acronym is GAP. So you can see here that they're a communist, but they're obviously talking about the nation, about patriotism, about freeing Italy from the German occupier. And they are among those planning an ambitious attack on the Germans in central Rome, March 23rd, 1944. Here we come back to the date. That is the 25th anniversary of the founding of the fascist party. So on the one hand, it's meant to commemorate in a very special way the founding of the Mussolini movement and to make a direct statement to the German occupiers. So what do they do? They focus on this Via Rosella attack, a street in central Rome, and if you've ever been there, the street kind of ascends. It goes up, it's cobbled over, as you can see, buildings on either side. And what's been happening already prior to March 23rd is a SS unit, a security force, many of them made up of Austrians from the Tyrol, who go out to a shooting range and then they return to barracks near the Ministry of the Interior. They take the same route every day, right? So Bentevania and Capone and others, it's really a group of about a dozen. There are people kind of moving in and out plan this attack for March 23rd. What they do is that Bentevania, he will dress up as a sanitation worker, wearing a blue uniform, he has a cap, he's pushing this cart. It's got two silver trash cans on there, mounted on a chassis with four wheels. One of the cans is containing rubbish. The other has 40 pounds of TNT. He's waiting at the top of the street and he has comrades at the bottom of the street. One of them will give a sign by lifting his cap. So when the Nazi column ascends that street, and of course is cobbled over these buildings on either side, he's going to detonate the TNT. Capone, her task during that is that after Bentevania lights the fuse, I mean, he's dressed as a sanitation worker, is to come up and put a raincoat over him so people won't link him at all to the attack. So sure enough, on March 23rd, this column takes the same route as they do every day, and they're singing, of course, in German, just to kind of rub it in the eyes of locals. There's been a lot of publicity around the city celebrating the anniversary of the Mussolini movement. And sure enough, when the signal, it's, it's interesting, by the way, Capone sees a group of school kids who are playing nearby and she yells at them, get away from here. You need to go home and do your homework. Get out of the street. And even Bentevania has to do that with some others there. You, it's time for you to go. You need to get out of here. But things, you know, there's another complication too we could get into where the column is about an hour to two hours late getting there, but nonetheless they show up and Bentevania, he actually tells an American reporter 30 years after the event, he said, I lit the fuse. And she asked him, what did you feel at that moment when you lit it? And he said, I didn't feel anything. I just walked off. And Capone came and covered him with a cloak. When that 40 pounds of TNT detonated, it absolutely you know, initiated hell on that street. It killed 33 members of this Nazi column, 
and some nine others will die subsequently of their wounds. It's quite a sight. And I have uh, an image here we'll show of the people who decide how to respond. I know I'm running out of time here, but I want to point out, ladies and gentlemen, that the attack is so severe. The casualties are so high that Hitler himself, once he get news of this, he says, I want a response that will make the world tremble. So that task is given to SS in Rome, led by Herbert Kapler. He's the, the man obviously showing his name there. He's the SD security, uh, the intelligence gathering wing of the SS in Rome, who's given this task. He will in turn assign the reprisal to Eric Priebke on the kind of right of this image, one of his subordinates. And this gets the full support of the German military in Rome, including full marshal Albert Kesselring right there in the center. 10 Italians for every SS member has to be put to death. They actually go a little over that. They round up people who are already in prison. They had been raids, rounding up resistance fighters already. And on March 24th, the next day, they take these, these individuals, men and boys, 335 of them, into caves, the Ardiatini caves, and they're shot in groups. And then bodies piled up on those who had been shot previously. It takes a matter of hours to do all the killing, and they dynamite the entrance to the caves. 335. There's the entrance right there to the, uh, to the caves. There will be actually many resistance fighters who will go in and leave carnations to remember the victims just days after this massacre, the Ardini Atini Caves Massacre. And wrapping up, I know I'm out of time here. What I want to point out, ladies and gentlemen, is that for a brief period, the CLN, this committee, will ask, no demand, an end to terrorist attacks of this sort. Terrorist in the sense of targeting individuals hold those attacks because of the level of repression. There's still an expectation the Allies are about to take the city. That, of course, doesn't happen until June 4th and 5th, 1944. Once they do, once the, the city does fall into Allied hands, though, in early June, you're going to see a real resurgence of attacks north of Rome as the Germans retreat there. And this is going to start a whole new phase, a partisan war in northern Italy, which is not only a war against the Germans, it's also a war against pro-Mussolini Italians. Finally, just to kind of conclude this, and we'll see what, uh, what the roundtable and the Q&A kind of yields and moving this forward, Phil Marshal Kesselring, 10 days after the Allies liberate Rome, makes a declaration where he says, the civilian population will be held accountable for all attacks on German personnel. And what you're going to see starting in the summer of 1944 is Eastern Europe methods. Things you saw in Poland and the Soviet Union, in occupied Yugoslavia, now being applied in Northern Italy, where the Germans just massacre entire villages in response to partisan attacks. But I thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen, and I look forward to remaining part of the discussion. Okay, great. Thanks to both of our panelists. We'll get to your Q&A in just a minute. I do have a couple of things I'd like to dig into just a little bit more. So uh, there's some really interesting threads of continuity between both of the cases that uh, you've written about. Um, and also some really interesting, subtle but important differences. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about who, what sort of people join these resistance movements. And given that you've written about these really terrible massacres and reprisal, uh, in, in your specific cases, what do you think motivated people to continue to resist after these reprisals took place? I'll, I'll jump in right there just to say that it's interesting in the case of the Italian resistance there were workers, um, especially in the north. You have to think about in, in Italy, northern Italy is the industrialized area, uh, southern Italy more agricultural. So there's a, there's a real working class base for the resistance in the north. Some of these individuals had never really abandoned their leftism. And we, we actually see a strike in Turin in northwestern Italy in March 1943, 
where fiat workers, I think most of us are familiar with fiat, begin to openly talk about Stalin and the Red Army are coming. Now, the Red Army, of course, is not anywhere near Italy, but this is a month after Stalingrad. And so you have a lot of workers are kind of forming the base of, of, of opposition, and they're joined by a lot of students. Both Bentivania and Capone are students. Bentivania is a medical student. Capone is a law student. They had grown up under fascism. They're in their early 20s, and they were like many younger Italians, totally disillusioned by fascist Italy's war. Capone had actually fallen in love with a man who in 1940 is sent off to Greece to fight in this ill-fated war where the Germans have to come bail out Mussolini, and he's killed shortly after deployment. And so there's a, there's a real sense among a lot of younger people that this is a disaster for Italy. Obviously, all of them don't become communists. Some of them gravitate to these other parties, but in this case, two of the most uh, important figures were, were indeed communists. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I guess I would say uh, much of what you have to say holds for the French case. Um, the, and I guess I would, that reprisals, depend, the circumstances during which reprisals took place in France, particularly when it was happening as the war was, the, as the tide was turning, had the effect of turning people against the regime. And there was also a sense, and this was cultivated within many of the resistance groups, that if people, that there was a duty to continue when others had, had, had been killed. And so there's a, there's a whole culture of uh, honoring and commemorating the fallen that gets carried into these resistance movements. And you see it in, in certain cases in France with um, particular groups who were involved in resistance, for example, um, railway workers. Uh, the, the railway workers uh, were known to, to pass on information to resist. And there were certain places in France where there were massacres, where in this, outside of Lille, for example, there were people who lived near a railway station who were taken out and shot. The case that I've worked on most um, fully, and, and, I, and I wrote a book about it, was a case in which a, a, the town in France was, um, the, the town of Oradour sur glane was attacked by uh, the Waffen SS in June of 1944 as they were came into the region to fight resistance and then were called up to the Normandy front. In the case of Oradour, there is no tight connection to resistance. And one of the paradoxes of that place and, that, and the way in which it was commemorated is the fact that there was not resistance at Oradour became a, um, the basis of a resistance that honored and even heroized the the suffering of people who had not been engaged. In other words, that this was thought of as a, as a, as a martyred village and that it was proof uh, that even if you didn't stick your neck out, you were possibly or potentially a victim. And that gave it, it's almost like a, a, it's almost like a counterbalance to the commemoration of the resistance of people who acted like de Gaulle and his followers. It's a, it's a commemoration of, um, those who didn't. And so it's interesting to think about the fact that it became the, the, the place it takes in the landscape of memorialization. Yeah, and Sarah, that, I think that's one of the things I found most interesting about your, your book about that case is the, uh, the, com the complexity of that commemoration process, especially compared to the post-World War I commemoration. So um, if both of you could uh, talk a little bit about how did that uh, process of trying to understand and create a narrative of these events shortly after uh, they took place and then after the war ended over time, how did those narratives and that commemoration effort uh, evolve over time? So we could start with Sarah on this one, if you Well, it like. started um, it, you know, immediately. I mean, one of the, uh, the image that I showed of de Gaulle speaking at the uh, town hall of Paris in August of 25th, 1944, you can go on to the site of the uh, national you can, you can Google it and you can find his speech, and if you find it with subtitles or if you understand French, you'll see that he must say the word Paris and French every other word, and it's, it's a whole uh, exercise, and it's remarkably well done in telling the French that France has liberated itself. 
And this was a very astute uh, political move. Um, one, the French, you people here probably know this history better than I do about the decision to liberate Paris. Patton wanted to continue on to Germany. Eisenhower said, we need to go, we need to liberate Paris. We, should, we can't bypass it. And the, the American army slowed down to allow the division led by Leclerc to go into the city first. And that was a decision also to have the French liberate Paris. And so in that speech, de Gaulle basically, and I think one of the reasons why he was loved to the, to the degree that he was, was partly that he gave, he sort of spread his mantle he, and to bring everybody in. And uh, he basically said, you were all resistors and, and he could stand for that. Yeah, if I could, in terms of dealing with the Italian cases, fascinating these comparisons and, and what they're learning from each other and following each other. The Committee of National Liberation, I mentioned, formed the day after the armistice, the day after the Allied landings in Italy is actually modeled on the, the French case and the Italians. It's not, not clear exactly what they learn and how they learn it, uh, but they're certainly following as best they can the French example of a, a kind of national committee that Moulin had done so much to bring together where de Gaulle would be considered the leader. The difference, of course, there is that you have Badoglio and the king still in Italy, um, and, and that's a great that causes enormous controversy within the committee, these six parties. Why, why should we support the king? He put Mussolini in the power in the first place, right? Why should we support Badoglio? He's an imperialist, he's a former fascist, et cetera, right? Why should we support them? And of course, eventually Badoglio will step aside in June 1944. You'll have, uh, the, the committee will become more and more an alternative government. Victor Emmanuel will make his own promises to step aside. And it, so there's, there's a lot of pressure that's being exerted from the committee to change things. But I would say one of the things that's remarkable about the Italian case and how it's remembered is that this committee does hold together through World War II. There are everybody from monarchists who have become disenchanted with Mussolini to the communists are in this. How can that possibly hold together? And yet it does. They do stay in the same fold throughout World War II. And there's no doubt it's German brutality. I was thinking about Rob's comments about the Germans and the Soviet Union. German brutality, as much as anything else, keeps them together. They will hold together the massacres in Northern Italy from June 1944 into the spring of 1945. That does wonders. There's a lot of young fascists that stand with Mussolini, work with the Germans in the North, execute partisans and sympathizers to the partisans. And so that the kind of resentment against that uh, in the North ensures that that movement stays together. But there's no doubt there's also a lot of mythologizing about the national unity that happens uh, after World War II that has to be debunked. Yeah, and so one more question for me and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, both of you have mentioned, so in the case of Ordor, there were Alsatians that were part of uh, the, the personnel that conducted the reprisals there. And then in the uh, Italian case, uh, Via Rosella, there were uh, folks from the Tyrol in that organization. And I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about what, uh, what was unique or interesting about their role, uh, both in the reprisals and then I know in the French case and the trial afterwards. Well, in, in, the, in the French case, there were, uh, in the, the division that uh, the, the uh, division Das Reich that came up for, came through the Limousin had uh, a battalion that was largely young people who had been drafted into the SS in Alsace, and that was part of the French. I'm sorry, the German um, policy of bringing in people into the SS from people they could be, that could be considered ethnic Germans of some sort or culturally German and bringing them into, uh, into, uh, into the SS, so you, into the Waffen SS. So, you, so you had uh, Tyrolians and you had uh, uh, Estonians and so forth who were German speaking brought in. And these, um, these soldiers referred to themselves 
later as malgré nous, people who were, in spite of themselves, that they had been uh, drafted by force. But nonetheless, the, uh, the participation of Alsatians in this massacre caused a, a, a enormous political trouble in France in the 50s when the soldiers from that division were, that were tried in, there was a military trial of them in, in the town of Bordeaux, and it suddenly this event, which had been the example of uh, the, the horrendousness of the Germans, suddenly turned into a kind of uh, Franco-French uh, uh, confrontation between two regions, and two regions that had very different political traditions as well. And so there was a, a kind of a, confront, a painful confrontation in Bordeaux uh, where the Alsatians tried to depict their, uh, the Alsatians as victims and the people of, of Oradour couldn't, uh, couldn't accept that. And so it ended up causing a rift whereby the commemoration at the town of Oradour turned its back on the French government and refused to accept any representatives of, of the national government to come to their commemorations. And in fact, they uh, moved their commemorative ceremonies to the, to the cemetery, uh, the local cemetery, and they left empty the monument that had been built by the national government. Yeah, it's really important to remember that the, the Nazis, in terms of occupation policy, they were always looking to uh, to exploit tensions, and in the, the Italian case, really treating Italians as, as traitors, despite Hitler's own personal affection for Mussolini, going to such great effort to rescue him and then install him as a puppet. Uh, there was a widespread sentiment uh, in the leadership and certainly in the German military that's stationed in Italy that the Italians are traitors. They betrayed, uh, they betrayed the alliance, and so stationing men from the Tyrol, this border region, contested region between Italy and Austria, was I think part of this pattern of that. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that when the, the Germans move into Italy with the armistice, that they take some 600,000 Italian service members into captivity and 45,000 of them perish. I mean, that's an astonishing number in a year and a half not counting the issue of foreign laborers, not counting the issue of Italian Jews deported to the death camps. Some 54,000 or so Italians die as partisans during the war, and we think maybe 120,000 Italian civilians die from September of 43 until late April of 1945. I mean, this is a side of World War II, I think, that often just gets overlooked. Is, is the sheer brutality of that war. I think as Americans, I think often for us, we think about Husky, then we think about the landings in September, there's Anzio, Monte Cassino, Rome falls, and the next thing you know, Italy's, you know, the, the fighting is over in April. Everything is shifted up to, uh, to France. So we, I think Americans, we tend to lose sight of that, and yet there is an incredibly vicious war that's being waged there. It's a bloody affair as the Allies are trying to crack the Gothic line. It takes months for them to do that, and behind the Gothic line is this partisan war that's also a civil war. Great. All right, thanks. So I think uh, Jeremy's ready with this microphone. Great. Well, thank you to Mark, Sarah, and Jason. We're going to start first to your left, please. Why does it take the Italians so long to kind of lose faith in Mussolini? There's nothing but military defeats the entire time. Hitler at least could kind of be riding on national popularity. They're winning really to the end of 42, but Italy's got a horrible track record. <laughs> that, that's a great question. Um, so to, to answer that, there, there's, a, there's a, a lot of things I think have to be considered is that, yes, Italy does have a, a number of defeats or in embarrassments in that 1940-41 period, right? When they go into southern France in June, they, they gain practically no ground there. Uh, Yugoslavia, they really kind of go in there with the Germans as kind of junior partners in terms of occupation duty. Greece is a real disaster. The Germans have to bail them out. There, there of course, I haven't mentioned about Italian units on the Eastern Front 
It's just a bloodbath for those that are there. That's often forgotten as well, the kind of tens of thousands of battalions who die fighting the Red Army. So yes, that does add up, but it's not really a case of the war having a dramatic effect on people on the home front until 1943. North Africa, I think, is really the deciding moment where that war, I think a lot of Italians, of course, have been watching it that had not gone well, then Rommel and the Africa Corps show up. Then in 1942, it looks like they might actually break through. They might actually push through Egypt. And then that falls apart. But yet, even then, it takes a while for the fallout of that to really come back home. The surrender in May of 43, and then well, what's going to happen next? The realization that the Allies are now coming. You know, the war's coming here. You know, the bombing raids on Rome that's, that start that summer, that really does bring the war home. So I would just say it's been kind of a slow burn, if I can use that phrase. There have been a lot of discontent, a lot of unease in the country. There were certainly anti-fascist elements that had never left the country still there, biding their time. And 1943 is the moment where you start to see mass get discontent and these anti-fascist elements begin to coalesce. That takes a while, but sure enough, it does become a mass movement. People will ask, how many, how many people take part in partisan activity in Italy? I noted mythologization, but I think we can safely say maybe 200,000. But compared to Germany and Austria, our first panel, right, that's a lot of people who are taking up arms fighting either the Germans and or pro-Mussolini Italians. So it takes a while. Next question is going to be in the center to your right, please. A good while ago, the Military History Quarterly rate called the French resistance the single most overrated force in World War II. And in light of your work, Dr. Sarah and Lynn Olson and Madame Forcade, uh, how effective would you have, in retrospect, uh, put the efforts of the uh, resistance in thwarting the Germans? Well, I think that there's, um I think people have fun in some ways sort of taking down the French resistance. Um, and um, I guess in some ways one could say that it's been, that whether the French resistance had a big effect militarily, it probably didn't. Nonetheless, they did give help to, they were important in giving information to the British. And one of the main things that the French resistance did was to propose early on a different idea of what France what, what, how things could be. So you had a kind of, uh, there were a variety of, of uh, ideas put forward, but you had, you had a consistent messages coming through for uh, what France could be, what Republican values mean. So I think that the French resistance is important for, on, on those grounds, and it may not be, uh, I don't know if it's the if one should only I guess I'll put it that way if one should only look at the resistance from its from a point of view of what it accomplished militarily because what it accomplished politically and socially is significant. We're going to stay to your right towards the front please. In uh, listening to both of you talk it, it seems to me that there's a big similarity between the French Vichy government versus the partisans, and then the Italian government versus the partisans. I wonder if you could talk about the similarities and differences from those two countries coming from an allied and Axis point of view. Well, that's an, um, well, there are a couple of different things to say. I suppose that um, from an allied Axis point of view, the French, um, the Vichy government was collaborating with Germany. And one of the things that makes France distinctive, I suppose, is the fact that you had a, German, a government that stayed uh, in power, but in power, nominally in power, and at the same time uh, proved to be progressively, uh, it became clear that how ineffectual it was in terms of uh, finding its own place within Hitler's Europe and then 
um, uh, pushing forward French interests. Um, and the fact that you had other groups claiming legitimacy that were and that were working the way that the, the, the Gaullists were in London, I think, makes it different than Italy. So um, I guess I, I don't think of the French government as being um, as, I don't think it was as, and you, you'll have to tell me this, I don't think it was as, the French government, part of what it was, was saying was that it was collaborating, but it, that it was still maintaining French independence, and it failed at that. But I don't know if the Italians were, if that was as much uh, 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 something that was part of what that government was trying to do. Yeah, it's, it is an good interesting, question. yeah, it is a very good question. It's interesting in the, the Italian context where like these groups, like these patriotic action groups, communist led, even though there are sometimes other, other, these other parties from the CLN represented and there's not, a, there's not a figure quite like Charles de Gaulle in the Italian context. There are different leaders, a man named Bonomi. He's a, kind of a moderate socialist who becomes kind of head of the CLN. But there's no doubt, like, one of the most influential people in the CLN is the communist leader, Palmiro Togliatti, who actually comes back to Italy about a week after the Via Rossella attack. And he had been in the Soviet Union, and he arrives a week after. And it's interesting that he, people are kind of wondering what, what direction is he going to go in now that he's there. And he makes what's called the Salerno turn. That's what people always remember it by. And, and we know this now, really have known since the 90s after the Soviet archives opened, that Stalin tells him, when you get to Italy, I want you to recognize Badoglio, and I want you to commit the Communist Party to a course that will say, we're not going to pursue social revolution. We're not going to pursue a revolution in property relations. We're going to cooperate in creating a kind of parliamentary democratic system in Italy. And we will stand by the other parties. And it's interesting that Togliatti toes that line for the remainder of the war. And, and so that's quite a moment um, again, he's not a de Gaulle figure, quite that level, but the fact that he says that the communists are going to play ball with the other parties, we're not going to pursue revolution, we just want a democratic system, we want the Germans out, and we want to ensure that justice is done to the victims of Mussolini as well. And that help, helps keep that together uh, for the remainder of the war, there's certainly a lot of suspicion on the part of the British and Americans about these liberation, these parties right in the CLN, but at the same time, they are giving them support. Harold Alexander, the British general who may take command really of all kind of forces there in Italy, he'll actually call on people to rise up against the Germans in the summer of 1944. You know, like rise up. I mean, we want to see partisan activity and yet, he and the Americans are, of course, concerned about what that might mean, especially if the communists continue to gain influence within the movement. So there's all these tensions that are there, and yet the whole thing does manage to hold together to the end of the war. I would like to add one thing, which is how much in play is your question about how did these governments or these countries appear to the Allies. Something that gets sometimes lost in this story or that uh, is that it was it was it was it was everything was in play. It was very dicey in the from basically from June when when the the opening of the Western Front and the fall. So that de Gaulle was completely left out of the discussions for D-Day. And he was not informed of what was going on. And then he showed up. He did his own landing at Bayeux a couple of days later, and it's quite remarkable. I mean, he, you know, he didn't show up in a rowboat, but you know, in a small. But he came to Bayeux, and he and he stepped off the boat and and did his his move, and uh, and then he sent out uh, twelve people who were named as uh, Commissaire de la République, and he had been also recognized by a government that had, the sort of provisional government had, um, actually that didn't happen until a few months later, but in any case, he got on the ground and quite quickly worked toward getting his representatives out into the regions. And he picked excellent people who went and tried to get control of the administration. But it was not clear until the fall that 
France would not be occupied. That AMGOT, the you know American, what is it, AMGOT, the American government of occupied territories, was possibly going to be running France. And one of the, the Gaulle's big successes was establishing himself and the Americans not going through with that. The next question is going to be all the way in the back to your left, please. Can you tell me a little bit about the role the partisans in Italy played with the negotiations with the SS and German army, April 45, in trying to achieve an early surrender? Yeah, I don't know a great deal about that. There is the, the CLN is, is negotiating with all kinds of people in the north to kind of bring the conflict to an end, including the Germans trying to end the bloodshed. And they, in fact, meet with Mussolini about circa April 25th. And April 25th, of course, if you if you've spent any time in Italy, that's a holiday associated with this big national uprising that's called and the CLN representatives are talking to Mussolini like, are you ready to, to give in? Are you ready to surrender? And those talks really just kind of fall apart. And as we know, Mussolini tries to escape to Switzerland uh, just a few days later, and it's a communist group of partisans. They're named after Garibaldi, uh, the, the great Italian nationalist key figure in the unification struggle of the 19th century. But yes, they had been negotiating with Mussolini and the Germans very late. And it's interesting, the Germans surrender literally like at the same time as Mussolini's being executed. It goes, it takes a few days for it to go into effect, but Hitler is still alive when all German forces in Italy officially do surrender. The CLN is involved. I don't want to overstate their role. Ultimately, the Allies are, are dictating what's going to happen. And what you'll even see in the spring and summer of 1945 is the Americans and the British insisting these partisan units, now that the war is winding down, is over, that they disarm. But they are involved very much in trying to bring the war to an end. Um, but none of them are exactly shedding tears when Mussolini is executed. Uh, and then, not a surprise, right, that they take him to Milan, where the party had been founded, and I don't know, most of us have probably seen that kind of grisly image of Mussolini and Clara Patacci being hung upside down in that square. That's where pro-Mussolini pro fascists had executed partisans earlier. So there's a direct element of payback of that. But I would encourage you, as disturbing as the image is, there's some images, including an art collection of that, where you actually see the crowds that have assembled to see the display of the bodies, and it's uh, stunning. Thousands of people coming out. In the front to your right, please. Uh, the British SOE supported all sorts of folks, but uh, the French resistance was their largest client, so to speak. Can you give us a sense of, comparatively, uh, who supported and how much the Italian resistance? Do you want to? Ah, I don't know how, in terms of um, how, how the Italian resistance was supported. I know in the in the in the French case, the SOE, uh, one of the goals struggles with the, with the British was that he didn't want them to arm uh, the communists. And for the SOE, anybody who was going to fight was was someone that they would uh, they would arm. And so the the arms drops that they and the help that they gave was particularly important sort of late in the war. And um, but in terms of of Compared to Italy, I don't know. Yeah, the, the SOE and, and the OSS are certainly providing arms to partisans in, in a similar way. I mean, they're obviously as the air war picks up and they have total dominance of the skies over Italy. You think in 1944, I, I wrote a, an article for the website about a P-47 pilot who flew 60 plus missions in Italy from October 44 to April of 45 and he didn't see a single German aircraft uh, during that time, right? So they were able to do a lot of airdrops for, for partisans there. Uh, in north, kind of far northeastern Italy, they get help from Tito. That's itself a kind of interesting story. 
uh, as well. And there's some Italian partisans will actually directly be in Yugoslavia when the war is over. Uh, so there are certainly contacts there. But the Americans, British, despite their reservations and concerns, they also realize the partisans are having some real effect. They're having some disruptive effect in Northern Italy. The Germans do have to assign units to put down these, these various uh, you know, attacks. And of course, they're savage in that. But yes, there is aid that goes directly there to them. And it gets easier for them to do that by the air the further the, the war goes along. We have time for one last question here. Dr. Dossi, what do you think about the Roberto Rossellini uh, Rome open city, almost contemporaneous uh, depiction of uh, resistance? Wow, what a great question. And I, I, I wish I had seen that more, uh, more recently to, to kind of think about that. But it, it is interesting the way already, I mean, that film was what, 1945, 46? I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, um, it, it's amazing how already the way that war is being remembered when it's not even completely over yet. And I think one area that's interesting to compare with Sarah's work is this dynamic in Italian history of mythologizing and then debunking the, the history of resistance. I was in Italy in 2019 on a, on a trip uh, for the museum, and I met with uh, a, a figure there who's who was very involved in documenting the history of the partisan war and also met Americans connected to the cemetery at Florence, the American cemetery at Florence. And it was interesting that the American was telling me that, you know, when I meet these guys who are in the partisan movement, they make it sound as if they did it all. You know, they liberated the entire country. Um, and, but it's interesting, it kind of as a moment of pride that they did take part in their own liberation. They did play this very active role. And you get this attempt already with a film like Open City to, to narrate how that had played out. And yet it's, it's all contested, right? I think one of the things we should remember is that the resistance was controversial then. It, it's controversial now in Italy. And I think it's safe to say in France, there, there's a lot of uh, division about how that's remembered and about the partisan war and about occupation and collaboration and it's hard to imagine that that's going to go away uh, anytime soon, especially with the recent Italian elections. Great. Well, for Mark, Sarah, and Jason, thank you very much for a resounding conclusion.